chug, 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 Welcome back to the Wizard Staff. I'm your host, Guy. And I'm Blake. And we are two drunk novices who like to talk about EDH. We drink and swear, so you've been warned. Please drink responsibly when you've been playing children's card games. Tonight we have a great episode. It's my pet episode, similar to how we did a episode a couple weeks back for Blake about the issues of quote-unquote fair magic. Tonight we will be talking about 10 things every game needs through EDA. So before we get into that, what are we drinking tonight? Well, since it's my pet episode, I get to pick, and I picked Guinness. Blake, have you ever had Guinness? Um, I have, actually. And what do you think? Um, it's pretty good, yeah. I don't know, like, of all the generic, I don't even, would you call Guinness generic? I feel like it's, like, a little, like, a step above generic. I think, I think it is a little step above generic. It, you could definitely find it in almost any store but it's not like if you go to a college party or any kind of like just social gathering that's going to be like a drink that's like always on hand unlike like uh bud light or coors miller or i don't even know what those kind of drinks are called they're trash (laughs) yeah but this is actually pretty good i would drink more than one of these and i am i'm I'm already like two in so we'll we're we're in a good spot here excellent it's Mm -hmm. just a drink that i've enjoyed a lot of the people that i've kind of like come to know like i'll say like hey try this and they will and then they say oh wow how can you drink this this is (laughs) awful you have bad taste apparently well also like whenever if i go to like a bar and they say like do you have guinness and they're like no and i say okay then what's the closest thing (laughs) Most of the time, they give me something that I really don't like. Like, a lot of the times <laughs> I've gotten this... Like, I went to, I went out with friends one time, and they gave me this, like, chocolate stout. And I was like, okay, let me try it. And it was, it was fucking awful. Chocolate alcohol. Oh my God. Ever, chocolate and alcohol usually don't mix very well. Usually. Usually not. No. Mm-hmm. All right. And before we get started, I also want to do two quick shout out and kind of like a reduction or redaction on one of our previous episodes so i had a friend who was listening to the mono pet red episode and he had mentioned how insurrection was one of the only ways that you could win or it was like one of those uh big red spells that make you win the game Mm -hmm. but my friend was listening to it and he was like uh hello What about Obliterate, which is a... Jesus, I didn't prepare for this. What Obliterate does. It is... It's a red spell. Can't be countered. Thank you. It costs six red red. And it can't be countered. And it destroys all artifacts, creatures, and lands. They cannot be regenerated. So it is a pretty good card that if you're able to, like, get it out and play, you're going to do quite a bit of damage and kind of like put everyone else so you want to be kind of ahead in the game when you play it um my friend i've only played he's only probably used it two times well did he win those two times i think so i'm pretty oh i want to say for sure that he probably won those games (laughs) because i was not ready and i was just like fuck (laughs) that sounds like you yeah all right so it's a pretty good card I guess I'll just say in my personal experience, I've played against it. Maybe I can remember specifically once and they did not win that game. So I'm just like, I stand by my previous statement. (laughs) Next is want to give a quick shout out to Powerpuff Boy 4 on Twitch. Very funny guy. He likes to play magic. He likes to play Overwatch. One of my friends that I play EDH with on a weekly basis. That's Go check him out. In. Yep, he said he'll plug us if we plug him. So go wrong. check out Powerpuff. <laughs> <laughs> go 
go check out Powerpuff Boy 4 on Twitch. All right. 10 things every game needs through EDH. What does that even mean? We often talk about Mark Rosewater, the godfather, or Alexander Hamilton of Magic the Gathering, <laughs> who quite often... Today we're going to talk about one of his articles called 10 Things Every Game Need. And to give a little backstory, Mark Rosewater wrote this article that makes, you know, what makes a game successful after he gave a presentation to his daughter's class about game design. So then he went on to record several, several episodes on his podcast dedicated to this topic. So it's, you know, for any wannabe game designer, this is definitely like a good tool that you should go check out. He does an episode on the, you know, 10 things as a whole. And then he goes into more detail and a lot more of his podcasts about each one in specific. This is my passion episode to follow on Blake's episode about fair in magic because as a designer myself fashion designer but I am very intrigued about how things work and why they work the way that they do so the goal of this episode is to assess how well EDH does at these 10 things and to see if it can improve in some aspects or like where it excels so it, it's also not meant to be an argument of why Commander might be the quote unquote best format because that's definitely up to debate and you know ultimately what you want to do with magic. Everybody already knows it is. All right, thank you, Blake. Though it's certain, so it certainly it, it certainly is our favorite though. But this is how Commander has taken the aspects of these you know ten commandments and how it's excelled with them. So I'm gonna go quickly into what are those 10 things? So number one, a goal or goals. Two, rules. Three, interaction. Four, a catch-up feature. Five, inertia. Six, surprise. Seven, strategy. Eight, flavor. Nine, a hook. And last but not least, 10, fun. And we'll get more into what each one of those means as we go through the episode. So, let's start with number one, a goal or goals. So, to quote Mark Rosewater, which I'll do after each time I talk about one of the 10 features, there needs to be a, go there needs to be a point for your game. What are the players trying to do? How do they win? So the goal of a typical Magic the Gathering game is to win most of the time. For Commander though, this can be expanded on because it's not only, you know, not everyone wants to necessarily win, but how you win the game or how you can just make an impact because there are certainly decks like Pillow Fort decks that maybe, you know, just want to help out other players. There are stack decks that like try and slow the game down. So in the setting of commander a goal can just be whatever you want it to be which makes it a much more personal it could also even be like you know i just want to like build a deck around dragons and just play dragons that just might be your goal um whereas in like super hyper competitive formats in magic you know their idea is just to win so exclusively yeah and so that that's what makes commander special because it's more about the social contract of trying to have fun for everyone instead of a normal magic game which is more or less competitive and about winning it's straightforward so, yeah these are and you know no one can tell you that these aren't valid goals also because then it's like fuck you this is the way that i want to play it's you know i, I want to this is how i like see fun and you know maybe it's uh just not their cup of tea but if it's the way that you want to play and you found like a environment where you're able to like be able to expand upon your goal or you it, edh just gives you that environment where you can excel at that mm-hmm do you have anything further you would like to say, Blake? Oh, no. We'll just talk about fun more at the very end. 
Okay, okay. Saving the most, probably most controversial of the ten for the end. Perfect. It's almost like we did that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so number two, rules. There needs to be a list of what players are and are not allowed to do. Restrictions are an important part of a game. Accomplishing your goal shouldn't be too easy. Unfortunately, I think this one doesn't change too greatly when it comes to EDH since it's built around the same foundation of Magic's core rules. The exceptions being that there is a commander damage, you have a commander, and technically there's no sideboard. But those are additional rules. So mm -hmm. there is, you know, what could make commander more interesting is additional rules that elevate the multiplayer format. Now these aren't meant to be strong recommendations, but possibilities that could happen, such as adding the monarch mechanic, which has been talked about. But this would just allow for you to expand upon in a much greater detail and length. And this is an area where commander, you know, this is where, you know, implementing the monarch mechanic has the potential to do. So I kind of want to stop you and ask you a question. Um, do you think, and there's not necessarily like a right or wrong answer, um, but it's like, do you think it's better to have fewer rules or to create more rules for the sake of trying to make things more interesting? I think it kind of depends. Mm -hmm. Cause it because it also might, yeah for me it for me it oh my god for me it depends i think just depends on the complexity of the rule i don't think the monarch mechanic is that complex of a rule where you know you could break the game with it but i also think that it's such an easy thing that you could take in and out where it could almost be like an optional rule similar to how you know it Similar in Uno, where, you know, can you stack the plus four or draw two cards? It just depends on, like, who you're playing with. And that's just an open discussion that you need to have before you play the game. Okay, because generally I lean towards the, like, fewer rules the better, because, um, like, I'm just not in favor of adding rules just to have more rules. Like, I feel like the monarch mechanic here is kind of kind of become the scapegoat of this. I'm sorry, all you listeners, but it's like the downsides, like for adding that just like far outweigh the upsides. It seems it's like it just adds a, com a complete mechanic to this game that when you have to tell new players how to play commander, it's like you got to explain all like it doesn't seem that much, you may say, but it is and it doesn't actually add that much benefit to the game like streamlining rules like making interrupts into instance and then creating the stack and then eliminating mana burn were all really important and it's better to just have streamlined rules is what it seems to me yeah and i mean yeah the monarch mechanic is just becoming the scapegoat of this and there may or may not be like a 100% right or wrong answer. I just think that since EDH is a casual format, it has the flexibility, and it's just depending on who you want to play with in your playgroups that, you know, makes EDH kind of elevated to a different standard of what, like, quote unquote, normal magic might be like, or like a 1v1 kind of setting. Yeah, and you can always make the argument like the game is complex enough as is you don't need to add more rules to make it more complex i mean you can always I mean, fall back on that argument I'm, it's in a lot of discussions yeah it has been kind of declared that magic is the most complicated game just because of the continuation of adding additional mechanics and rules where it's just super overwhelming at times Moving on to number three, interaction. So there needs to be some aspects of the game that encourage the players to react to another. What does your game do to make the players interact? 
Blake, I know that you had a lot to say on this, so I'm going to let you kind of lead the way on this one. Yeah, I'm going to kind of take over your episode just temporarily. So I have like a lot of thoughts about how like the word interaction is defined differently by casuals and competitives specifically within EDH. Um, a couple of years ago, I read like a Facebook post by a person named Josh Deering. And I'm just, it was so well written. I'm honestly just going to read it verbatim. It's really well written and it flows really well. So it says, um, let's talk seriously and politely for a moment about differences between the mindsets of competitives and con casual players centered around one key thing, interaction. I often hear uh, and read players on both sides lament the lack of interaction they see on the other side of the tracks. Both sides tend to think they have like the monopoly on interaction, probably because both sides define it differently. So the trends that they've noticed is that competitive players tend to love counter spells, interacting to things at instant speed on the stack, spot removal used judiciously at key points in the game, complex lines of play, winning by top, uh, taking out the entire table at once, assuming that any strategy is fair game, and politics in the style of like Mexican standoffs versus uh, casual players who tend to love board wipes, resetting the board state, eschewing anything that neuters their own strategy completely. Uh, they prefer to play at sorcery speed, have highly individualized definitions of what constitutes fair play. See my other episode. And prefer politics in the style of like making deals. So let's use Counterspell as an example here. A competitive player will consider that an excellent example of interaction who tried to do a thing, he responded to it, interacted, simple as that. But many casual players will often look at that and feel uh, bereft of interaction, like there wasn't any actu actually interaction. They wanted you to have to react to their big creature attacking, um, not react to it on the stack before they even got to play it. Uh, they, they often get a feeling that a countered spell was somehow stolen from them, not interacted with. You didn't interact with my big creature, you just said no. Now, not every casual player hates counter spells, uh, but it's a fair example of a common phenomenon and problem, and it illustrates this mindset pretty well. Um, in both casual and competitive circles, players are looking for a style, or, or a type or style of interaction, but interaction is defined differently by these two groups. Um, combos are another example. Um, some casual players call combos solitaire and non-interactive. I've been told, like, personally, that, like, oh, he's just solitaire and I'm just gonna tune out. Um, but a counterpoint to that is the question, if you're not interact, if you can't interact with combos in some way in your deck, aren't you also playing non-interactive? And there probably isn't a right or wrong answer to that question, especially when both sides, again, define it differently. But the main issue is just like, there's a lot of demonizing of how the other guys play out there and it doesn't really help anyone. Again, just realize different people want different things and adjust your expectations accordingly. Try to understand the way other people are thinking and it'll help you not only in magic, but in life. Yeah, and it kind of goes back to <clears throat> the goals of magic because, you know, casuals uh not casuals combo players may that might be their one goal and actually i don't even know where i want to go with this to be honest <laughs> it's just kind of a way of like oh interacting because like in the end the combo players are interacting with the like the group like they might just be doing a lot of stuff with them selves but it does then affect like the whole board so they are interacting with them in some capacity i just but does that all make sense where like each each side is kind of defining it differently and they're left dissatisfied with how the other person played and no one's actually wrong they just kind of are just have different views on like how to define it yeah i would agree though that it just also goes back to the fact of you know talking with people and seeing what you want out of the game because you know it's not going to be fun for anyone if you know you have two different mindsets of uh what you want to achieve because 
if you are competitive and you want to like just kind of like say no to everything just so you could like get stuff out like that's not gonna make it fun for the other players in like this semi-casual format yeah all right i'm done with my rant excellent ranting like all right so we're gonna move on to number four a catch-up feature so there needs to be a way for players that have fallen behind to catch up the game becomes frustrating if a player feels like he or she has no chance of winning interaction and catch-up kind of go together since they have a similar tie-in with the politics of edh starting off though we have the mana system which is a self-built-in mechanic to the game that allows for people to catch back up with their opponents if they happen to get mana screwed which can build intense and dramatic moments between players if someone's able to pull through at the last minute because the way that you play is making sure that you have the mana to play the spells that you want to play so politics is your catch-up feature and can also be part of your interactions politics are not an aspect in any other magic the gathering format since you normally have just one opponent and you don't really go to your one opponent and say hey don't kill me next turn because i think i can take the other guy out wink wink <laughs> they'd be like uh fuck you that's exactly why i'm killing you right now uh yeah edh is different in that if you're just behind uh the other three or so players in the pod can just fight amongst themselves and waste resources and then like you're just kind of keeping your head down and like late game you just shoot out ahead and win that happens quite a lot actually um i think we all have stories of that happening where you're just kind of like trying to suppress everybody who's like the yourself and like maybe one or two other people and like you all just waste energy trying to stop each other and then the one person who's been behind like most of the game just like it's like okay i'm gonna do my thing now and just and wins yeah one of i think my favorite stories is i was playing like a five player game and I was really far behind and I was trying to have like everyone take pity on me but then I was able to just get out like smothering tides that I got a bunch of mana and then I just was like bam 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 got out platinum angel avacyn armageddon boom catch up right there all in one turn yeah oh yeah it seems pretty good before we move on to the next one, I just kind of want to make a quick side note. Like, due to the chance that there will be, like, there will be games where you get mana screwed, even if you have the like the right ratio of lands in your deck, um, and you will lose. It's inevitable. You just kind of got to accept it, lose with grace, because most games that won't happen. If you really feel bad about it, you can always just. Because I can kind of understand the idea of like, all right, you're really not doing anything this game because you're getting hard, like, land screwed just out of pure chance. And uh, you can always scoop at instant speed. Like, if you feel like like you're absolutely so far behind in catching up, like there's not even a chance to catch up, I'll understand if you scoop. Most people will. This is where I would like to make a side note and say that Armageddon isn't actually all that bad because it kind of like <laughs> resets the game. So everyone's in a very like similar position, you know? You just need to get to four lands. <laughs> yeah, you just need four. You need two white and then two generic. Yeah. You did Unless, of course, if you have Avacyn. <sighs> so, number five, Inertia. There needs to be something in your game that moves it along towards completion. You have to have something built into your game that makes sure it ends. Game length in EDH is an issue that like, I think within the last year, a lot of people have started talking about. Some people want short games and some people want long games. And it's difficult to tell when you start a game, you sit down and you play with people, how long everyone wants that game to be. Um, I'd say almost like on average, what do you think, an hour? An hour is like an average EDH game? Uh, yeah, an hour, hour and a half. Because you can kind of say that game length somewhat correlates to power level. The higher the power level, the shorter the game will be, generally speaking. But like that doesn't always happen. There are exceptions. Also, like I believe it was Mark who said that uh, Richard Garfield, um, one of the founding fathers of Magic, 
realized early on that the game needed to end one way or another, so we made the milling rule, where if your library is empty and you want to draw a card and you couldn't, then you'd automatically lose. And he said how that's a really important part of uh, the game and how it works. It's like the game needs to end one way or another. I wonder if this is kind of why the RC came up with the idea of commander damage was because they knew since you have like a such a like you almost have double the size of a normal magic deck that it would still take a much longer time for you to draw through your whole deck so they were like okay if any one player takes 21 damage from you know their elder dragon yep then they lose or Probably. I mean, commun- commun- cumulative, cumulative, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I bet that's probably a factor because, like, yeah, EDH has like a hundred cards or ninety-nine cards in the main deck, which is a lot more than any other format. It just makes consistency a lot lower, like arguably just because of the number of cards and it's singleton so Mm -hmm. i would yeah it's another commander damage rule is another way of making sure the game ends quickly although uh it's not always relevant most of the time but that's a different discussion for a different time next we have surprise so there needs to be elements of your game that the players cannot predict people enjoy being surprised you have to make sure that your game has moments that are unexpected. So in normal Magic the Gathering, you have the surprise of what is your opponent playing. But in a competitive sense, I would argue that you could probably take a good guess what your opponent is playing since they are playing to win and you would run just the most optimized build of their archetype. Kind of very similar to how the Yu-Gi-Oh meta is set up, where if they're playing, I don't know. This I use Blue Eyes White Dragon because that's the only one that I know. It's if the they're only playing Yu-Gi-Oh Blue Eyes White, know. yeah. <laughs> if they're playing Blue Eyes White Dragon, I know that they're gonna run three Blue Eyes Alternative White Dragons. Like it's just a given. Like why would you not? Just I mean, unless if money's a factor. But EDH, however, is a little different. You do have the standard staples for each commander, but not everyone plays to win, or at least not in the competitive sense, which gives people the opportunity to run combos or even like pet cards that you might not otherwise see, which kind of elevates that surprise. So another reason why EDH is able to succeed at the surprise element better than modern or standard is that it is a singleton format with 99 cards so the consistency to pull off the same combo is not as likely as other formats part of the reason why i took apart uh my jace deck this is now just speaking from personal but so part of the reason why i just took apart jace was for the reason that it was just too consistent and i felt like it just played the same almost every game so it just wasn't fun and then it eliminated the like surprise element because my opponents would then just know okay here's where i need to counter this so for you like there wasn't really any surprise left in your jace deck you kind of knew what the lines of play to your win condition were and you just did them too much where you kind of got bored with them yeah and i like jace enough where I kind of want it to be fun in that sense and that's kind of why I've taken out a lot of these uh, really strong cards that are in Jace and that's why I'm just building like one strict CD C E D H deck which I know will be able to like run very consistently and I'll be able to play it in a very competitive like manner but with Jace you know if I want to play it with friends I want to be able to like build it so it's a it's like a little different or it's not as strong and just able to like combo off as quickly as it used to 
Okay. Well, the one thing I will add to this surprise category is that um, everyone has a different threshold of what they find to be like boringly consistent, where they know what will happen next with almost 100% certainty. Um, I think because Dylan, who was on a previous episode, he gets bored with almost any like magic card or any deck pretty easily because he's just played for so long and he's just seen it all. But then there's also the complete opposite of players that I've met where it's like, it's like everything's brand new to them. Like they just love anything and everything. They never get tired of it. Um, and also players looking at different formats or even within the format that they primarily play um, can be a bit harsh about, oh, like this deck just does the same thing all the time. And I personally have been like caught doing this, I think especially towards the beginning of this podcast where I'm like a bit unnecessarily harsh about other formats, like say modern or standard for their high levels of consistency and lack of surprise. But as I've been watching more, especially with commentary, it's like there's still a high degree of like surprise, like, oh, what are they going to do next? Do they have like their piece in hand that they're going to play to win the game this turn or not and it is pretty suspenseful especially with narration so um i just kind of want to admit like you know i'm wrong sometimes and i'm like i think people can just be a bit harsh like oh this is just this format or this deck is just boringly consistent like it doesn't surprise me it's not even fun in the idea that fun and your goals in a different format maybe that is just what you want to do is like you know your goal is to win and your definition of fun is to win so maybe that is kind of like the right place for you but edh kind of just opens up a lot more to surprise because you know we also have often talked about like our pet cards and these are cards that we just run for fun and it's not yeah. like yeah that's true there's just there's n- there's not really room for pet cards within those other formats. It's like it's so strict to your um, win con. Like there's not really room. Like there's like some creativity like in the sideboard, but like it's so constricted and it's more like focused, but I do think it is inherently less. Yeah, and I mean I would maybe also even argue that like your sideboard's more of your just answer kind of like you have these cards because it just depends on what your opponent's playing um i also thought of like i think as i was writing this i was also just thinking about how broken hogak was in modern at the time where he was just able to like come out turn two it was like almost super consistent where it was turn just to dominating. Hogak what a surprise yeah and so maybe I was just thinking of like that but that may not be the case for like every single deck in water yeah you don't want to generalize too much number seven eight and nine we're going to kind of put together so I'm going to read each one of them number seven is strategy there needs to be something in your game that allows players to get better over time. The reason people like playing games again is that they want to use knowledge from past games to do better in future games. Eight, flavor. Besides having mechanics, a game wants to have trapping. It wants to be about something. Sometimes this comes first and the game is built around it. Sometimes the mechanics come first and a flavor is found to match it. Either way, games are more fun if the elements of the game refer a story or environment or a theme. And number nine, a hook. If you want people to play your game, there has to be something about it that encourages people to want to try it. If you're selling your game, the hook is what you use to market it. So, connected these three because they revolve around the most important part of what I see to be EDH's mechanic and that is your commander. So you have the hook 
Magic's initial hook is that you are a wizard, or a planeswalker, who is traveling across the multiverse onto different planes and dueling other wizards by using magical resources called mana. Ooh. Now, if this already wasn't badass enough for you 30-year-olds out there, <laughs> EDH's main selling point is that you get to use your favorite legendary creature as your commander, or your com companion, and com call upon them to lead your spells and creatures to victory. And how you want to play with your favorite legendary creature goes back to the strategy and hook. Yeah, like every person I've, I will say every person I've taught EDH to has has liked it. They either play like to the, like I taught them and they play to this day, or they had like enough going on in their life where they like were like, wow, I really enjoy this, but I have enough going on in my life. I can't really afford to get invested in this time wise or financially, but they always say that they enjoyed playing it. Right. Yeah. And then it, going it's in. Good. It's good at hooking people. Yes. I. One of the things I think at first, because I remember going to a game store like two or three years before I started playing EDH. And I went with my brother who was playing Magic at the time. And the game store owner tried to get me into it by introducing me with the, you know, starter decks. Didn't really interest me all that much. I was just kind of like, uh, okay. I mean, you know, it seems cool. I like Yu-Gi-Oh more, but like, it's not that bad, I guess. Uh, cause I just thought like, oh, it's lame. Yu-Gi-Oh, so cool. You, you angsty teen. <laughs> At that time, I think I was uh, a freshman in college. Ooh. But <laughs> so, but then, you know, once you told me, like, you have this commander, you have a huge deck, I was like, uh, okay. But then I started, like, actually playing games, and I was like, oh, you know, this is actually much cooler now. Because <laughs> I, like, you know, and it was also just because, like, the hook of... Uh, the Ur Dragon deck, I was like, ooh, dragons. I love this. I literally got you the deck because I'm like, he loves dragons. Like, I'm gonna get him on this. I got him. <laughs> and I feel like if you hadn't gotten me that, I probably would have probably not played Magic because like that was <laughs> that was that was the initial hook for me. Yeah. Because now I don't even play with. I mean, I still play with dragons. Like dragons are awesome, but. It's not like all my cards now revolve around dragons. <laughs> Alright, next. Strategy. So your whole deck is built around a strategy of how to use your commander. Whether you are playing Voltron, Infect, Mill, or Storm. You are looking for cards that best synergize with your commander's ability. Commanders open up strategies much more than any other format since it's... Arguably, Commander is much more restrictive to how you can build around that strategy being a singleton format. But at the same time, it opens up strategies that you might not see often as much, such as Infect or Voltron. Yeah, so like when putting a card in your EDH deck, you you should always ask like, how does this relate like to my 99 main deck and my Commander? Because I don't know, putting good stuff in your deck, you can do that, but you should probably put in a little bit more effort than that. Almost every commander you can look at and be like, there's a strategy to this. If I play it enough, I can even fine tune it. Yeah, when looking at the cards and like thinking about like, oh, does this relate to my strategy? Not to like contradict what we've said earlier, but like, because you can <laughs> still like put in cards that make your deck more unique to you but since your deck is so large you have that room and flexibility to have like you know maybe 75 percent of it is meant to be the optimal cards and then you have like the 25 percent that's you know what you want to do or like cards that are just fun for you yeah you can do that if you want <laughs> there's yeah. not really a right or wrong answer no and 
I mean, that's... That's just what I'm going to say this entire episode. There's not a right or wrong answer. Yeah, not to like... (laughs) Just going to remain a neutral motherfucker over here. Right. Not And, you know, that just kind of saves our asses (laughs) now. And now for flavor. So, Borthos is a deck type that is built around the commander's identity. And not color identity. But as a character in the Magic the Gathering universe. Since legendary creatures are meant to be specific characters um the whole game is meant to like tell a story but legendary creatures are meant to be like kind of like the main characters Forthos allows for players to use cards that they might not play otherwise so i could play with a super high powered jace deck and maybe i don't want to run every single variant of jace because maybe only two or three of them are good <laughs> in edh arguably now that i've you know decided oh this is gonna be more fun maybe i do want to run like every single version of jace to just put into there so you could run jace the mind sculptor you can run jace cunning castaway just because that fits into the flavor of the deck of jace same with avicen I may not run Avicen's Mask because it's also not that great of a card, but if I really just wanted to build a deck around the fact that it's Avicen, why not? Yeah, and like, there's like, there's actually a lot of ways you can like incorporate flavor. There's like mechanics, like you can incorporate it through mechanics, like storm, flying, flashback, etc. There's permanent types, like super friends, enchantments, artifacts, lands matter. There's archetypes, like aristocrats, wheels, tribal. And then there's like what you said, Vorthos, which is all things relating to that set or like specific commander lore. Um, and then there's just like some really weird, obscure flavor things like like women looking left and like chair tribal and weird shit like that. Like there's a lot of ways in which you can incorporate flavor. Um, like, like what kind of basics you run, like whether they're full art, unstable or zendikar or just like guru or there's like lots of ways to incorporate flavor through like your art choice as well like there's just so many ways you can choose flavor and there's again there's no one right answer yeah and between strategy and flavor you can almost go kind of like half and a half especially if you're just like i said you could maybe run 75 percent optimal 25 percent casual and you know 25 percent of those casual cards are cards that are meant to be like flavor added meant for you know i just really like chairs or women looking out windows very obscure things that you know it may not always come up but when it does it just adds to the element of surprise (laughs) it's all coming together now it's all coming together (laughs) all right now we move on to the final category fun So there needs to be something that allows the players to enjoy themselves. The number one reason people play games is for entertainment. If your game isn't fun to play, then people won't want to play it. Wow, mind blowing, but true. Yeah. So this one is probably the toughest to assess because it's just hard to define in general. Because what is fun to me isn't always fun to my opponents. What each EDH does well at fun is that it allows you to find a playgroup and stick with them and hopefully you just have the same idea or can like put each other's and play with each other's like kind of fun because you all have like a similar idea where you're not going to like get mad or run off (laughs) so you can define your own house rules, ban lists, and variants to commander that can optimize your games so just going back to the first point of goals commander allows you to build like this variety of play styles and deck types that are just custom to you and what you deem to be fun so just what isn't fun for edh is like going to an lgs and playing with people you don't know like strangers and having different perspectives of fun 
This ties back to Blake's fair problem, with where communication is just critical before playing a game, so that the table has a consensus of what, you know, the play experience is wants to be. It can be tricky because even when you try and explain what you want your play experience to be, someone else can misinterpret it in a whole different way and make your experience not fun. But what EDH still does well is, I don't know, in in the end, you're probably still going to walk away from the night nine out of time, nine out of ten times saying like, I had a fun time. Yep. Uh, just communicate with people. I know, like, the most difficult part of magic, actually talking to people. Oh, scary. So, do you have any final Social. thoughts, Guy? Yes. Do you have any final thoughts, Guy, on your pet episode? Well, uh, you and I had talked about this a bit, and we were trying to discuss, like, do we think that there's a magic color combination excels the most at these ten things? And I think you could almost make an argument for every single color combination. I, think I don't want to go into. I don't want to go into detail about how each one could like kind of fit that criteria, just because we're already getting to a long episode. Drank a lot. Oh, of you, oh, you don't want to do a ten-hour podcast? Rude. Oh, why don't you edit it and <laughs> put together everything, Blake? You know, yeah. Let let's let you do that now. You could make an argument for almost any of the color combinations. It was just kind of like more of an exercise of thought. Is there one where in Commander you might, you know, need to just design cards for to kind of like help elevate the experience? I know that Boros is often talked about as kind of like the weakest of combinations, but it still kind of fits into the... I think it still fit all 10 criteria. I think it can still fit all of them. Right, and I agree that it still could fit all 10 of them. Maybe... It doesn't fit all 10 of them as well, but it still fits all 10 of them. Yeah, like every sense. single yeah, every single color identity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't have anything else to say, Blake, do you? Uh Nope. <laughs> Excellent. I'm going to chug all this right. last bit of beer. That's what I'm going to do. All right. Well, thank you very much for listening. Please go <sighs> check out our Twitter, wizardstaff101 at uh, at <laughs> wizardstaff101 we got our email thewizardstaff101 at gmail.com I recently started trying to make an Instagram where I just post a bunch of memes I haven't done too much with it yet I've been trying to take it a little slowly but go follow us there feel free to reach out to us on any of these platforms we'd love to hear from you ooh ooh I just, I just thought of something you can let us know who has the sexier voice? I don't need to know that. But <laughs> if you really want to tell us, sure. Why not? Thank you very much for thank you very much for listening. We hope you have a great night. Peace.